So, since this book is called On the Art of the Kabbalah, what did this process look like on a practical level? Well, to ask this question of Kabbalah is a bit short-sighted, or at least I think it signals a modern bias towards materialism, or at the very least, its thirst for results. Either on account of deeply ingrained tendencies toward folk practice, or alternatively, on account of being children of the Enlightenment and its spirit of mastery over nature, modern people of all kinds of backgrounds tend to see the theoretical as subordinate or supplementary to the practical. Well, this is definitely not in line with the elitist view espoused by ancient idealists like the Platonists and Pythagoreans, for whom practical matters, like, say, engineering, were base and servile and for whom truth laid up only in the realm of intelligibles set apart from all the practical dimensions of this world. From within a platonic paradigm, to ask how is this practical is to signal that you don't really get Platonism. The practical is shadows on the wall, and the journey back toward the one is one of theoretical and contemplative ascent. This is not the seven habits for highly effective people, uh, the art of the deal, or how to win friends and influence people. Plato's ideal republic does not exist to be perfect in practice. It exists to be perfect in the realm of ideas, which contains truth in its intelligible and corporeal form, not its sensible forms. Now, Christian Kabbalists in the line of Pico were well aware that Kabbalah was divided into two parts, the practical or technical and the speculative or theoretical. In Book 1, Reuchlin is firmly planted in the speculative side of Kabbalah, and this is really the side that, to him, had soteriological matters as a foremost concern. It's about being saved, and therefore its central theme is the Messiah who does the saving. In Book 2, Reuchlin concentrates on fleshing out the relationship between Kabbalah and Pythagoreanism, and lastly in Book 3 is where we find the more practical material, though by practical I mean things like discussions about the 50 gates of intelligence, the 32 paths of wisdom, made up from the 22 Hebrew letters and the 10 Sfirot, or enumerations of nothingness. And then with the 50 gates, plus the 32 paths, we get the 72 angels, each of whom have names made up of Hebrew letter permutations. This permutation of letters is a major topic in this book. Now, 72 is the numerical value of the Tetragrammaton. Uh, Reuchlin writes, Any Hebrew letter you take stands for a particular number, Thus, in this way, yod he vav he equals 72. Yod means 10, he 5, vav 6, and he 5 again. Put together arithmetically, then, yod is 10, yod he is 15, yod he vav is 21, yod he vav he 26. Now add 10, 15, 21, and 26 and the answer is 72. Charles Zika, in an article on Reuchlin's De Verbo Mirifico from the 1970s, explains some of its mysteries in more detail. The yod, the I or Y, with the form of a point and the numerical value of 10, expresses the originally undivided unity and principle of extension in all things. It signifies, therefore, the beginning, communication, and end of all things. The he, with the numerical value of 5, expresses the combination of binary and ternary, the trinity of God and the duality of the world, and so signifies procession rather than essence. The vav, the u or v or w, with the numerical equivalent of 6, a total made up of unity, binary, and ternary, 1 plus 2 plus 3, 2 times 3, signifies the perfecting element. It is the perfection of the emanation process. 
the sign of the whole corporeal world which has progressed from the original unity. The second He, as a halfway between one and ten, expresses the human soul as a medium between the higher and the lower, and indirectly thereby the return of all to its beginning. In other words, the practical stuff is more speculative stuff, at least as far as most modern people are concerned. So if you ask Roiklin how is this practical, he would tell you that the salvation of your immortal soul should eclipse any practical concern in terms of importance. Kabbalah is symbolic theology, and the practical part of it is about decoding its symbols. But this decoding is not an end in and of itself, but a means to an end, which is reconciliation and union with God. Now, in terms of working your way up the golden chain from the practical to the speculative, here's what Reuchlin writes, again through the mouth of his character, Simon the Jew. I must make clear one thing, the truth of which is shown by reason and confirmed by experience. It requires a good deal of skill, a minute knowledge of the humanities, and much hard learning for eagerness and intelligence to accustom a man to the contemplation of the separate forms and the simple substances of the intelligible world above, sufficiently for him to creep into God's own sanctuary. First we need to know the ethics and morality of sensible people, so that we avoid base behavior, aiming for integrity. As Ecclesiastes warns, guard your steps when you enter God's house, and Ethan the Ezraite wrote the song, Justice and Judgment are before his seat. This hymn refers not only to the justice of man's action, but also to the thoughts in his heart and the words of his mouth. Hence the concurring opinion of the Kabbalists that indulging your lusts, your evil inclinations, as do the stupid, destroys the desire for speculation. Once one's morals have been put in good order, and the mind cleansed, here I say nothing on the regulation of correct, truthful, or good speech, which is only the gateway to knowledge, its entrance hall, not knowledge itself. Then one must study mathematics and physics in all their many branches, in Arabic and Greek and Latin texts, taking in all numbers, weights, and measures, and all there is on the subject of motion and rest, the essential states, as they say, of nature. But what is to become of us when we attempt the investigation of the highest spiritual causes? To this end, we will need abstractions of lower things, argument, reasoning, and logical speculation. These can easily take up one's whole life, for it is no easy task to learn a thing's properties. In the normal terminology, predicates, the most general logical genera, substance, quantity, quality, relation, time and place, arrangement, appearance, active and passive, it is believed that everything on this globe exists and is understood in these ways. Day and night, men set nets and traps to catch one by one the causes of each thing, the material, the formal, the efficient and final causes. With all this activity, we can cheerfully flatter ourselves that we can hunt down truth with some self-evident, as they call it, demonstration which goes from one extreme to the other like running from starting line to winning post, using that device known as a syllogism. This is the trap, the snare, the bait, the noose in which, in their opinion, free truth is to be captured. This is what they employ in studying things like physics dependent on the natural world, or in mathematics, adjunct to it, or those that in some way escape nature, like metaphysics.
Anyone familiar with my work will know that, in the Middle Ages, there were many who believed that the sum of all learning in the seven liberal arts, the trivium and the quadrivium, was to achieve communion with one's perfect nature, and thereby be able to wield the wonders of magic. Well, for the Christian Kabbalists of the European Renaissance, Kabbalah and Pythagoreanism were, to use the words of Wouter Honograph, better than magic. For Reuchlin, there were many different kinds of magic or wonderworking, that is, producing miracles. Like Pico before him, Reuchlin was not interested in the prestidigitation of street entertainers and the tricks of charlatans. He was not interested in the practical talismanic astral magic of the Picatrix or Ficino's three books on life, and he was certainly not interested in the demonic magic Goetia or Nigromancia that violated God's laws against idolatry, as Maimonides had decried in his Guide for the Perplexed. These were all demonic delusions and superstitions as far as Reuchlin was concerned, even if he did believe in the influence of astrology more generally. All true magic came from God, in particular from the use of his names. It was with these names that Moses defeated Pharaoh's sorcerers, Elijah brought down fire from heaven to beat the priests of Baal, and Daniel calmed the lion's den. In the words of Henry Morley, Of all names by which wonders can be wrought, the mirific word of words was the concealed name of God, the Shem Hamephorosh. Whoever knows the true pronunciation of the name Jehovah, the name from which all other divine names in the world spring as the branches from a tree, the name that binds together all the spherot, whoever has that in his mouth has the world in his mouth. When it is spoken, angels are stirred by the wave of sound. It rules all creatures, works all miracles. It commands all the inferior names of deity, which are borne by the several angels that in heaven govern the respective nations of the earth. There was, therefore, a form of magic or miracle working that did not constitute base superstitions. And this, above all, occurred when God fashioned himself into a man and opened the way for man to fashion himself into God and achieve the supreme good. Keeping this in mind, Reuchlin defined Kabbalah as follows. You will see that Kabbalah is a study heaven bestowed and of the utmost importance to man. Without it, none can achieve something as elusive, as difficult, as the apprehension of the divine. For it is certainly not material given to the proofs of mere mortal reasoning, empty-worded thorny arguments, man's syllogisms. The subject matter is divine. So big, so great, so infinite is it that in one generation even the tireless work of man could not master it, even if our lifespans stretched to many generations, since we are obviously living in this mud and clay of the thick lump that is the living body, and we use the bodily senses in all we take on. The Hebrew sages say, explain the power behind the work of creation? Impossible. How much more so with Merkava? So we must do as specialist writers do. Trust individuals in their own fields. The logician depends on a grammarian for his prose. The speechwriter takes some of his arguments from the logician. The poet and orator needs help from the musician. Geometers borrow proportion from arithmeticians. Astronomy relies for numbers, figures, and dimensions on mathematics. Metaphysics makes use of the conjectures of the natural sciences. 
Every higher science rightly takes for granted the conclusions of the more basic forms of knowledge, and makes no attempt to demonstrate what is already proved. Assertions are unreservedly trusted. Otherwise, no man could in one lifetime fully investigate the smallest chain of reasoning in any one discipline. If this is what happens in human sciences, where men accept cheap, mechanical tradesman stuff by word of mouth, and trust those they think are good on one subject alone, then are we to despise the tradition of these holy men? That is, the handing down, hence Kabbalah in the Hebrew, in accepting this knowledge of the divine where none of us is really able to approach the subject? Kabbalah is a matter of divine revelation handed down to further the contemplation of distinct forms and the contemplation of God. Contemplation bringing salvation. Kabbalah is the receiving of this through symbols. Now I will come to your question. What is it that has been revealed? No one would have me believe that you are asking me to tell you all the revelations that have ever been put forward, for they are countless. Rather, you want the primal, all-embracing, special revelation of the divine to which all individual revelations can be brought back. Well. It is none other than the universal restoration, after the primordial fall of the human race, which is called salvation. It was concerning this salvation that the first revelation of all things appeared to us. So, according to Maimonides, Adam understood that he was to die in sin. We Kabbalists understand it this way, too. In all this, what is to be considered divine revelation? Without doubt, nothing we have looked at could be judged to be directly independent of either rational or instinctive motives, except for that baleful breaking of the law. Oh, that insulting assault on the great and good God! Such outrageous impudence, such polluting wantonness, poisonous, pestilential, stinking filth as has corrupted the race of man, poison sinking deep into our veins, spreading slowly by the flow of semen through the generations. And our frail human thought processes cannot picture how it is to be purged, in what way the stream diverted. Now, I say now at the point of near despair of this destructive disease, was there need of divine revelation's powerful assistance, and God the Creator did not abandon his creatures. He hinted at hope, still possible despite the monstrous offense against his infinite majesty. He allowed that after a certain passage of time, The charge should be wiped out, cancelled, annulled. In Adam's hearing, he said to the angels, And now, lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. And he sent him forth from the garden of delight. These were the last words, as he was driven from the garden, the poor man heard from the mouth of God but in it he found hope in his Creator, hope in the midst of torments and grief, that with the passing of time his fearful sentence would, through the mercy of God, be remitted. The very words showed him that, when he said, Now lest he put forth his hand, and take also of the tree of life. Now God, then, as now, never employs a word without purpose, and his use of the present tense suggests that the sentence would not be in perpetuity. At some time in the future it would be possible to obtain remission. There would come a man chosen to eat of the tree of life, though for his own part, 
Adam suspected that his punishment was irrevocable while there was still breath left in his body. God no longer talked with him face to face as he had done, a clear sign of his anger and his estrangement. God, the creator of all, had once held conversation with all living things, both man and beast. Now he disdained to talk face to face with the sinner man. But the father is of great forbearance. Not to leave Adam bereft of consolation, he straightway sent an angel to teach him how the ruins could one day be rebuilt. In the commentary on the Book of Creation, the Kabbalists write, Our father's teachers were famous angels. Raziel was Adam's. By the will of God, this angel showed him the path to atonement. He gave Adam divine words to be interpreted allegorically in the way of Kabbalah. No word, no letter, however trifling, not even the punctuation, was without significance. So the angel Raziel was sent to Adam as he lay grief-stricken to console him, and the angel said, Don't lie shuddering, burdened with grief, thinking of your responsibility for bringing the race of man to perdition. The primal sin will be purged in this way. From your seed will be born a just man, a man of peace, a hero whose name will, in pity, contain these four letters, Yod, He, Vav, He and through his upright trustfulness and peaceable sacrifice, will put out his hand and take from the tree of life, and the fruit of that tree will be salvation to all who hope for it. After this speech, Adam, while abandoned, condemned to all the unhappiness, the pain, the grief he met, still in such adversity, trusted in God and hoped for forgiveness of his transgressions, and moved by a love for his maker that is beyond belief, was thankful for divine mercy. This was the first Kabbalah of all, the announcement of primordial salvation. How praiseworthy! How much to be desired! What could be more apt? What more fitting a gift that those on high should bestow on men in their hopeless situation, no succor could be more timely, as with the announcement of an amnesty to prisoners. This is the highest and most holy revelation. All God's revelations can be reduced to it. This is the most beloved of handings down. It encapsulates the principles of Kabbalah, all the traditions concerning the divine, knowledge of heaven, visions of the prophets, and the meditations of the blessed. Adam told all of this openly to his wife, and so that posterity should remember and give thanks, he built an altar and began sacrifice. The rabbis tell us Adam was the first to offer up a sacrifice, and Eve was now to be the mother of living men. Her despair ceased, and in time she lay with her husband, conceived, and bore her first child. Flushed with immense, unbelievable joy, she thought that she had given birth to her Savior. I have the man! of four letters, she cried aloud, meaning the letters the angel had mentioned. She called her new son Cain. When his parents realized that, contrary to their hopes, he was vicious and bad, they again set out about the process of giving birth and produced Abel. To the two young men, they handed down the Kabbalah they had themselves received concerning the restoration to well-being. 
Abel died childless. For a long time, Adam waited to see whether he would find in his grandchildren what he had not found in his children. But no hope was to be had in the rejected offspring of Cain. All his confidence in them had vanished long since. They were all busy with trade, manufacture, servile occupations, chasing after their trivial creature comforts, concerned for the needs of the body. They had no thought for the divine, nor for noble matters, or the things worthy of God-like men. So Adam begged another child from God, and his request was granted, at which this pious father was beside himself with happiness. God has given me another child, in place of Abel, whom Cain slew. This new child he called Seth. At last our father Adam was presented with a grandson by Seth. Adam still held in mind the Kabbalah he had received from Raziel, that from his seed would be born a savior. So the child was named Enos, that is, man. It was thought, indeed strongly hoped, that his name would accord with the Kabbalah of the angel, the four-letter name yod heh vav or be at the least, quote, in mercy, or, more Kabbalistically, that he would have the letter S, between the four letters. In the sacred account is written, though the translation here is not too well phrased, they began to invoke the name of the Lord. The translation is accurate, but some of the more thoughtful Kabbalists have made a more correct interpretation than is rendered by the literal translation. According to Gematria, he wanted to be called by the letter S. In the art of Kabbalah, this is equivalent to in mercy. Now, according to Notarikon, the letter M stands for in the middle of, understood the four letters yod he vav he. Thus the phrase is altered to read, he wanted to be called the letter Shin in the middle of the four letters yod he vav he. Enos, Enoch's father, would take from the tree of life in accordance with the angel's message and redeem the world as a godlike man bearing the name yod he in mercy vav he. Note this well. It is a sacred mystery. The text goes on at length and gives an elaborate history recapitulating many episodes from the Old Testament in chronological order, but taking time along the way to flesh out many of the symbolic mysteries in its salvational history, whether through Gematria, Isopsephi, Notarikon, Timura, or some other Kabbalistic technique. Now, there's really no way for me to succinctly summarize everything discussed in the book, but it suffices to say that on the side of Kabbalah, Reuchlin's ideas were taken from as broad a range of sources as the Sefer Yetzirah, the Zohar, indirectly, the Bahir, the books of Abraham Abulafia, Nachmanides, Menachem Rekanati, Maimonides' Guide for the Perplexed, Joseph Gikatiya's Gates of Light, Abraham Ibn Ezra's The Mystery of the Law, and so on and so on, while his Pythagorean ideas covered in Book 2 are likewise taken from a broad range of sources. Hesiod, Plato's Dialogues, the Metaphysics of Aristotle, the writings of Numenius, Ammonius, Plotinus, Porphyry, Iamblichus, Macrobius, and so on. All the major figures of the Platonic or Pythagorean tradition are accounted for and discussed in no small detail. Now, as we can see from this abridged passage I just read, there's a critical component to this story in keeping with the words of William Blake, that eternity is in love with the productions of time, whereby the unintelligible divine 
stretches out to touch the finitude of man. This occurs wholly through God's revelation of his own true divine name. God's name was an expression of God's love to man. It was like a golden ladder in the intellect. As John the Evangelist had written, God loved the world by giving his only begotten Son, the word, that whosoever believes in it shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We've already seen how in Reuchlin's 1494 De Verbo Mirifico, built up from concepts laid down in Pico's conclusions, God was associated with the Messiah, the Tetragrammaton, yod He vav He, and identified with the Pythagorean Tetractus of the Decad, the numerological quaternity that sits transcendentally at the root of all reality. The purpose of this divine name, while it was an aspect of God himself, was ultimately to reconcile and to transform man into God. This was the miracle or wonder in the wonder-working word. This is why Pythagoras used to say, the Tetractus would transmit to our souls the source of everlastingness. This could be seen in keeping with, to use an obscure example, the Chaldaic oracles attributed to Zoroaster, namely that oracle which says, The paternal mind accepts not the soul's will until she go out of oblivion and pronounce a word inserting the remembrance of the pure paternal symbol. Where Gemistus Pletho had interpreted this watchword as the pursuit of the good by which the soul becomes most acceptable to her maker, Reuchlin, Pico, and the other Christian Kabbalists took it quite literally. Now, on the practical level, a problem with all this is that knowing the name of God did not simply entail knowing some of its mysteries. It also entailed knowing the correct pronunciation, and this was a task that, in Reuchlin's own day, was not easily accomplished among a people like the Latins, who were ignorant of the Hebrew spoken by Moses specifically, and of Semitic languages more generally. Such tetragrammatical speculations which so heavily privileged esoteric doctrine were not cherished by all, especially not by those who wished to distance themselves from any whiff of Judaism, in this case by refocusing attention on an old ritual that had been practiced by the high priests in the temple on the Day of Atonement, the temple which the incarnate Christ was supposed to have replaced forever. This wasn't a problem for Reuchlin, of course, because behind the Tetragrammaton lay lurking the hidden name of Jesus, as we've just seen recapitulated in De Arte Kabbalistica. This was the true wonder-working word. The name of Jesus spelled yod He shin vav He, The pronounceable pentagrammaton comprised of the four letters of the unpronounceable tetragrammaton, but with a shin, the consonant symbolizing the trinity, especially the spirit, and the phrase in mercy. This was inserted to connect the two vowels on either side and thereby make the forbidden, ineffable name become sayable, as Yehoshua, a name which in origin means yod he vav he is salvation, or deliverance. In this world where the ontological and the semiological were fully intertwined, to correctly pronounce this name and meditate on its secrets was like opening a portal that ripped through the sensible world and opened up the way through the intelligible on into the unintelligible realms of God and of eternal salvation. It was a watchword, a totempas, a kind of golden Orphic lamella made by God himself, which contained the spirit of the words, I am a child of earth and starry heaven, but my nature is of heaven alone. 
This theme of divine language is a thread which runs throughout all of Reuchlin's work on Kabbalah. Regarding this later De Arte Kabbalistica specifically, however, to use the words of Moshe Edel, with its emphasis on contemplation and symbols, it is less inclined to the overemphasis on magic that characterizes, under the influence of Pico, his earlier De Verbo Mirifico. Since this book culminates with a typically Christian topic, the hidden name and the occult power of the Christ, it is less perceptive towards the claims of Jewish Kabbalah. In De Arte Kabbalistica, the Christological interpretation notwithstanding, and this point really can't be underemphasized here, the attitude towards the Jews is much more liberal, even sympathetic. Reuchlin's stance vis-à-vis the Jews had gradually changed over time, and this involved a shift from trying to understand Hebrew learning through a Christocentric, polemical lens towards trying to understand it a bit more on its own terms. What started as a willingness to appropriate, interpolate, and repudiate in good medieval disputational style gradually turned towards a willingness to listen, to admire, and appreciate. There's no doubt this softening of attitudes from one work of Kabbalah in 1494 to another in 1517 was on account of all his conflicts with Johannes Pfefferkorn, the Dominicans of Cologne, and their decade-long campaign against the Talmud. It's clear, however, that in spite of this change of attitudes and all his Jewish learning, Reuchlin never wavered on his Catholic faith until his dying day, though it's safe to say that he understood his faith wholly in the light of the ancient theology passed down by the Pythagoreans and the Platonists, and thought this theology to be consubstantial with the very mysteries imparted by God in a number of wondrous ways. In the end, the greatest of these mysteries remained the same throughout his career. This was a name, the name, of which Zechariah had made the prophecy, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, and in that day shall the Lord be one, and his name one. Dear Viewer, Just like Johannes Reuchlin and all the humanist scholars of the Renaissance, I have not taken a Dominican vow of poverty, and so I don't have the support of a convent or order to produce this kind of freely available work. If you found value in any of my videos, lectures, or audiobooks, and have the princely means to contribute, I've recently launched a page on Patreon where you can help support the flow of regular, well-researched content like this on the history of Western esotericism. I also appreciate one-time donations via crypto and PayPal. Thank you for your support, and above all, thank you for watching.